God bless you. Okay, in chapter 7, uh, we're going to move on to forecasting models. And, you know, a lot of stuff maybe that we did at the beginning of the class, you may say, that wasn't very useful for me. You know, I don't, I'm not in a manufacturing environment. I don't do investment, portfolio, marketing, whatever it might be. I'm not sure linear programming uh, is something that I can apply. But I think almost everyone, in some way or another, does forecast at their workplace. Uh, whatever it might be, okay? So forecasting is simply the process of predicting the future. And that's, you know, one of the main components of management. If you look at managerial verbs, we plan, we decide, we organize, and we forecast, okay? So we can make better decisions, okay? Almost every business enterprise uh, uses forecasting. Manufacturing firms forecast demand for their product. Service organizations forecast customer arrival patterns. Uh, forecasting, uh, you know, security analysts forecast you know, what's the earnings per share going to be of a certain stock for the next quarter or the next year. Uh, we look at economic forecasts, housing start, changes in gross, uh, gross uh, national profit. All these kind of things are used in the business world, okay? Forecasting can lead to a lot of positive things. Uh, if you know approximately what your demand is going to be, you can reduce your inventory, you can set appropriate staffing levels, uh, and you can increase the customer satisfaction because, uh, you know, I mean, a good, good example of poor forecasting uh, is being played out right now with, with, with healthcare.gov, right? I mean, it's a technical problem, but the problem is they couldn't handle the demand. There's other problems, but that was one of the problems. They didn't forecast properly the number of people that would be hitting that website at once. So, that can really decrease customer satisfaction. Um, now the forecasting process itself can be based on a couple of things. First one is educated guess. Uh, you know, it could be educated based on a lot of different things, but I forecast that uh, the, the Red Sox are gonna win the World Series. Okay, that's an educated guess. Well, they're gonna lead three games or two. Uh, I forecast that the Penguins will win 51 games. Okay, that's an educated guess at this point, right? That's my personal opinion. It can also be expert opinion. Okay? It can be informed opinion, it can be expert opinion. A lot of times when we see economic forecasts, you know, these highly trained economics and economists, they're looking at data, but it's also their expert opinion. From based on what I see, I'm saying this. Or a weather forecast is a good example of an expert opinion. They look at data, they look at you know, low pressure systems and high pressure systems, but they also apply their knowledge and expertise to come up with your forecast. And sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. What we're going to focus on in this class is we're going to look at past history of data, also known as a time series. Because a lot of times, not always, we can't, we can't totally rely on it, what data has done in the past is a good predictor of what will be done in the future. Okay? We use this model a lot of things, like credit scores, you know, how you paid things in the past, is a good predictor of how you're going to pay things in the future. Um, how you perform as a student in high school is probably a decent predictor of how you're going to perform in college, right? Like, same thing with, with on a job. How you perform in college is usually a pretty good predictor of how you're going to do on the job. So we look back at time series, and we all have time series. Uh, if we talk about St. Francis, the most important revenue generating component for us is student enrollment, right? So we have, going back 20, 30 years, there's a spreadsheet of how many first-time incoming freshmen came to St. Francis University. We have a spreadsheet that says over the last 15 years, I can't remember how old the MBA program is, but it's about 15 years old, I think maybe older, probably older, maybe 20 years old, uh, how many MBA students we had enrolled in the program, right? And we use that to try to forecast forward. Okay? You may have sales, you may have uh, how much we use in expenses, you may have you know, how much mileage we travel, whatever it might be. But there are four distinct components of a time series. Not every time series has each one of these things, but let's talk about each one. The first one is what's happening over the long term. We talk about long term trend. A lot of times we see time series, which are usually denoted, by the way, via a line chart. Maybe they're going up and they're going down, but over the long haul, they're exhibiting an upward trend or a downward trend. 
Uh, and these trends can also be linear, they could be uh, exponential. But if you see something that looks like this, you know, it's going up and it's going down. But over the long haul, it's generating, looks like a positive linear trend. Okay, we've seen negative. So long term trend is, you know, it can also be stationary. It can be going up and down, but, you know, it's, it's really stationary over time. We don't see a long term trend. So what's going on over the long term? Now it's typically modeled as linear, and that's what we're going to focus on, meaning a line, a quadratic or an exponential function, you know, which have you know, more, more severe slopes uh, the longer we get out in time, but we're going to focus on linear. So that's one component. The second component, I'm sure you've seen before, is called seasonal variation. Seasonal variation is any repetitive pattern that is tied to a calendar, okay, tied to a seasonal calendar. Uh, we see this in a lot of different fields, uh, pool cleaning, right, uh, in this area, uh, lawn care services, retail, right, they, Black Friday, right, where, where, where all their sales come in November. They, they ramp up because they can predict that. They know we're going to be busy in, in November for the Christmas season. Um, when does St. Francis get busy? We know it's seasonal, right? I'm sure Smith Myers does less business, I'm sure, in the summer months. Maybe LPG does a lot less business in the summer months. IBP runs. So it's seasonal, tied to the calendar. Now it can be tied to, you know, like the 12-month the, the, the calendar, like a whole year, but it could be monthly season. Um, you know, in banking, I know the first of the month or, or the first month or whenever these checks come in, right, are always big, big days. That's seasonality, right? You can predict that. You know, hey, we better ramp up the staff. Um, it can be tied to weeks, right? It could be tied to the days of the week, Friday or Monday, Tuesday. It could be the tied to hours. I know if you look at internet usage on our campus, it's very seasonal. It's not seasonal in that it's busier in December than it is in November, but it's daily seasonal. Obviously, it goes down you know, like 2, 3, 4, 5 a.m. when people are sleeping. And as soon as people wake up, you know, it spikes back up again. So any variation, any repetitive pattern that happens over time, okay? Calendar or climatic changes, uh, frequently tied to yearly cycles, but not just yearly cycles. Could be uh, weekly cycles, quarterly cycles, monthly cycles, daily cycles, some kind of, you know, time cycle, right? So those are the first two components. And those, we're not so bad at predicting, okay? We're usually pretty good at saying, hey, I see this is happening over the long term, so if I see this is happening, I can predict up here. And if I see a pattern happening overall, I can try to emulate that pattern. I say, hey, you know, I go up 20% in the month of November, so let's throw a 20% premium on that forecast, because I know November is a good month for me, right? We're usually pretty good at these first two components. The two that we're not so good at, and the two that we're not so good at is the third one here, which is a cyclical variation. And you've probably heard someone say before, hey, the economy is cyclical. It doesn't really have to do with what the president's doing or what the Fed's doing or you know, the, 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 the uh, monetary bank's doing. It's cyclical. It goes up and it goes down. So for example, if we're trying to forecast our sales, you know, we may have been trending upwards, but hey, economy hit a recession, it went down, it really wasn't related to what we've been doing, it's related to the environment we're in, right? It's a cyclical change, a cyclical variation that really, you know, is something outside of us, right? It's outside of what we're doing. An upturn or downturn, not tied to seasonal variation, but usually tied to a change in economic conditions. Recessions, uh, inflationary periods, you know, depressions, now those are cyclical uh, variations. And the fourth one is the worst, okay, for a statistician to predict. And that is random effects, okay? Random effects are just that. Random effects that happen that we couldn't have planned for, they weren't tied to seasonal variation, they weren't tied to cyclical variation, it just happened. Uh, maybe you're working at Burger King, and all of a sudden two bingo buses pull up. So, you, know, you didn't know that was going to happen, you didn't forecast it, you didn't predict it, but all of a sudden, uh, this hour, instead of serving 40 customers, you serve 400, right? Just a random effect, that happens. Sometimes enrollment in certain majors goes up and it goes down, and we're not really sure why. 
We say, well, just a random effect, right? We have a lot of counts come in, or we didn't have a lot of counts come in. Sometimes it's side of things, sometimes it's not. So we look at these things. We can have a stationary time series, which might look like this. Okay, it's obviously going up and it's going down, but over the long haul, it's pretty stationary. So if I observe this data over time, where would I predict? What would I predict going forward? If I saw this data over time, what would I predict? Say this is 52 weeks worth of demand for whatever my product is, me go with it. Okay, going up and going down. And this line is the best fit. Well, I predict this value. Okay? Even though I know it goes up and it goes down, but hey, it's oscillating around this line. So I'm going to predict this value for week 53. And then, you know what? Because it's stationary, what would I predict for week 54? Because I believe it to be stationary. What would I predict for week 54? The same value. And for week 55, the same value, right? Now, if I have something that exhibits long-term trend, like maybe positive linear trend, you know, it's going up and it's going down, but boy, this thing definitely, over the long haul, is headed upward. That's a little bit different, right? We may say, here's a line that best fits those points. So it's going up every week a little bit. Obviously, it's going down sometimes, but you know, it's heading up. We're going to use that line to predict the future. And what we predict for week 53 is going to be lower than what we predict for week 54, or what we predict for week 55 and week 56. So we think that trend is going to continue. If it happened in the past, we believe it's going to continue. Now, sometimes we have both linear trend and seasonality. Okay, this one's heading up for sure, but we can see repetitive patterns presenting themselves. You know, it kind of bellies out here, then it spikes and plateaus and peaks again. But we can see that same pattern playing out here. So it bellies out, it's, you know, it, it, it spikes and plateaus and it spikes again. We see that pattern being, so if we map these months, maybe this is, I don't know, maybe this is this is February, and then March gets warmer, people start golfing again. And then, you know, March is kind of dark, the people are, you know, St. Patrick's Day, and then, you know, April's Day, whatever. Okay? So if we start mapping that out and saying, hey, this seems to be a trend in this month, or this week, or this day, we can start to see this. Now, what we do for that is we predict, we try to smooth it out as much as we can, but then we use the long-term trend but usually apply a seasonality, seasonal adjusted factor. Have you ever heard like the unemployment rate adjusted for seasonal inflation or seasonal unemployment? You know, that's what they're saying. They're saying, hey, it's just because this time of year, people are looking for jobs or people are, you know, unemployment rates down because it's Christmas time, okay? So they adjust for that, okay? So that's what we're going to do. All right, so how are we going to do uh, these forecasts? Well, we're going to use Excel, and there are some steps that we're going to follow. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go and take a look at the data that we have to this point, whether it's 52 weeks worth of data, 10 years worth of data. We're going to try to visualize it, and from that, and we're going to apply some techniques to it, from that, we're going to say, we think this follows a long-term linear trend. Or we think this follows a long-term negative linear trend. Or we think it is a stationary trend. Or we think it has seasonality. So the first thing is, we're going to hypothesize a form for the time series model. What we're going to look at first in this class is we're only going to look at two to begin with. We're going to say either the time series is stationary, 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 or it exhibits, it exhibits linear trend. Those are the only two we're gonna focus on for this first part, okay? So we're gonna say, hey, this time series going up and it's going down, but it looks like it's fairly stationary, or B, it's exhibiting linear trend, either positive or negative. You know, going up or going down. Once we have proved our hypothesis, 
Then we're going to pick a forecasting technique. Now when we talk about stationary models, I'm going to teach you four different forecasting techniques. The first one is so easy, I really feel bad teaching it to you. It's called the last period technique. We'll talk about that. With the name, it's pretty much all you need to know about that. And it's a valid forecasting technique. Whatever the last period was, is our forecast for the next. The second technique under stationary forecast is something called the moving average method. Okay, the moving average says, hey, the last period technique just looks at the last period, and let's look at the last three weeks, or the last four weeks, or the last two years, and calculate an average. The third technique is called the weighted moving average kind of the moving average, but I say, hey, let's give more weight to the more recent examples. And those three are very, very easy. And the fourth one is an iterative technique, and I'm going to teach you all these, called exponential smooth. Now, if we say that the time series is linear, there are two techniques, but we're only really going to use one. The first one we can use, which is pretty dominant, is regression, or least squares regression. What line best fits those points? You guys have probably seen that before. Maybe in economics class in our undergraduate class, in our graduate program, perhaps. Maybe in undergraduate stats. And the second one, which we're not going to spend much time with, is something called Holtz technique, which is kind of akin to exponential smoothing. They're, they're similar techniques. One is geared toward stationary. One is geared toward, um, toward linear trend. So I'm going to prove what kind of time series I have. I'm going to select a technique, and then I'm going to use that technique to prepare a forecast. Okay? That's all. That's all I'm going to do. So I collect the historical data, graph the data versus time, hypothesize a form for the time series model, verify it statistically, uh, select the technique, and I've showed you the techniques that we're going to use, and then prepare a forecast selected technique, okay? Um, let's do an example. Then we'll come back. On page 393, there's an example. I'll read that off again. Uh, and then we'll We'll work with this. Now I'll go through the steps we're going to use one, two, and three. So, Galaxy Industries is interested in forecasting weekly demand for its Yoho brand yo yos over the coming years so they can properly allocate a budget for the division. Because Yoho yo yos are a reasonably mature product, Galaxy believes that next year's demand for the yo yos will be quite similar to the demand encountered this year. Hence, the firm has decided to base its forecast on the past 52 weeks of demand. Weekly yo yo demand. Uh, in boxes of 12 during the past 52 weeks, given this table. Uh, in fact, it's okay, so let's look at the data. So I would like you to go to Blackboard. And under Chapter 7, go to Material by Chapter. Under there, go to Chapter 7. At the very bottom, not the very bottom, 
middle, I guess, you'll see Yoho data. And I want you to open that. So in week one of last year, the man was 415, the yo-yos, week two, 236, 348, 272, 280, 395. What I would like to do first is visually look at this to see if I can see any trend or if it's going to go pretty stationary. So a couple things I can do. Uh, it's probably the quickest and the dirtiest, the easiest to just highlight all the data. So A1 down to B53. Go up to insert. And I'm just going to insert a scatter diagram. You see, guys, see scatter over here? And just the first form of scatter diagram. You should come up with something like this. So the weeks are shown on the x axis, demand is shown on the y axis. Uh, you know, I can make this graph pop a little more, give a black background to it. And I could change the title, you guys know how to do those kind of things, but visually looking at it, what would you say about demand? Is it trending upward, trending downward, really needed? What would you say? Chris? Yeah, I would say visually looking at it, if I had to put my money on the, on the line, I would say it's stationary. Okay, I don't see it heading upward or heading down, right? It looks like it's going up and it's going down, but it looks like those dots are pretty stationary. Okay, I don't see any big changes there uh, long-term upward or downward, okay? Now, that's not enough just to visually look at it. I'd like to see that statistically. So, I'm going to do it a different way than your book. I'm going to show you the way your book does it as well, but I'll show you the way I think we'll do it because it's a little bit easier. I want you to right click on any of these points. Right click with your mouse. And go down to add trend line. And it brings up this dialogue. And let's add a linear trend line. <coughs> and on the very bottom, it says display equation on chart, display R squared value on chart. And I'll talk about what those are in a second. So click those two last boxes. Check those on. And then click close. So you see up here, it gives us a couple things. It gives us a line, and visually looking at that line, it's trending a little bit upward, right? But it's pretty flat. It doesn't like have a severe slope up or a severe slope down. So Chris kind of looks like Chris was, was right. But here's what I want to look at, okay? A couple things. The line that best fits those points in this case is y is equal to uh, 0.3339x, 3339x plus 369. So the slope is relatively small when we compare it to the y-intercept, right? 0.33369 as compared to 369. So it's not real significant. Remember, x is time in this case. So time isn't really driving this thing. Now the thing that I really want to focus on is the r squared value. The R squared value is known as the coefficient of determination. And it is the percentage 
of the movement of the y value that can be determined by the movement of the x value. It's always between 0 and 1 because it's a percentage. It's always between 0 and 1. It is the percentage of the movement of the y value, in this case the man, that begin, can be determined by movement in the x value, in this case time. My r squared value here is 0 0.0027. So about a quarter of 1% of the movement of the y value is determined by time. If this was trending upward, time would have a much bigger factor in that because time is driving it up or time is driving it down. In this case, it's a, such a small number, we're saying, hey, this is stationary. Time isn't driving it up or driving it down. It has very little effect on where it's headed. There's other things that have effect on it, but time doesn't. Generally speaking, we're just going to say anything with an R squared value less than 0.15 is station. And I want to show you that as opposed to something with linear trends. So I'm going to go to sheet two and just mock up something with linear trends. So I'm going to say uh, this is weak and this is demand and I'm going to say let's see one two three I'm just going to do let's say 12 I'm going to do 12 months worth of demand I'm just making up values I just wanted to make something that I know is going to look at it like it has a trend. So when I have the data in it, let's do that same analysis. Let's take that data, A1 through B13, insert, scatter diagram, boom. Take a look at this thing because I mocked it up. Wow. Looks like it has very strong positive linear relationship, as you can see, trending upward, positive line. Let's see how much time determines the movement of the y value. If I right click on any of the points, add trend line, linear, display equation, display r squared, click close. I see a couple things. The slope is very significant as compared to the y-intercept, 101 versus 5. It's not negligible. And finally, the r-squared value, the coefficient of determination is 94%. So it's saying 94% of the movement of demand is predicated off time. It has a big impact. So it definitely is driving it upward as time goes on. This one would be a linear trend, okay, as opposed to the previous one, which is a stationary trend. So the first step, when we say is hypothesize a model, this is what we're going to do. Okay, we're going to graph it. We're going to add a trend line, display the equation, display the r squared value. And we're going to analyze it. Is it stationary or does it have trend? Now you can quit listening to me for the next five minutes if you like. Uh, but I'm going to show you what the book does, how the book does this. Okay? How the book does this is it uses the regression tool in Excel. So if I go to data, data analysis, regression and it's asking where my y values are and my y values are the demand it's asking where my x values are and my x values are the weeks 
Uh, there's labels in the first row, so I'm going to check that box. And I click OK. And it does a regression analysis. And you're going to see some of the same things you see up here you're going to see in what we did. Okay. It has a slope, you can see 339, and an intercept, which you see. Uh, it also has an R squared value up above, which is the same or very similar R squared value to what we saw, 0 0.0267. What your book tells you to look at to determine if this thing has slope is a p-value. You guys remember p-value? Stats? A p-value says, what's the chance if I make this claim I'm wrong? So we're trying to prove when we do a regression that the slope is not equal to zero. And the p-value here, and I want to look at the, the period one, is 0.71601. So it says, if I try to prove that the slope is not equal to zero, meaning it has some trend, there's a 72% chance I'd be wrong if I made that claim. On the rule of statistics, 72% chance of being wrong, you don't go, you don't leave the house with that. Okay? We're looking for p-values. If we want to say that it has trend, we want to make sure the p-value, the chance of us being wrong when we say that, is less than 5%. So, if this value is less than 0.05, we can make that claim that it has linear trend. Because it's not, we say, hey, it's stationary, which is the same damn thing we did said when we did it my way, right? I'll show you with the other one, the other data set. Just do a regression analysis on that real quick. Data, data analysis, regression. I want B1 through B13. A1 through A13, I click OK, and you can see this p-value in this case is very, very small, 0 0.000000173, that 1.73 times 10 to the negative 7. So it's saying there's almost no doubt that this thing has linear trend. Okay? There's, there's overwhelming evidence that this thing has linear trend. Now, what I just showed you with the regression, if you read the book, that's how the book teaches you to do it. You don't have to do it the way the book does. You can do it the way I taught you to do it. Whichever you prefer. You can do it this way or that way. It doesn't matter. This, I think, sends the, I taught this way for the first couple of years, and students just weren't, weren't getting it. So, I just put it. Okay? So, you can either add trend line, do it my way, or you can do it the book's way. But this is saying, the, the slope's not equal to zero. There's a lot of it. Right, less than 0.05 and it's very small. All right, so uh, we're going to take a break here. All we've done to this point is look at the data we have and say, is it stationary or is it linear trend? When we come back, we'll take like a 15 minute break. When we come back, we're going to go over some techniques once we know it's stationary and some techniques we'll use once we know it's linear trend. All right. All right.